want to hear us talking. What's with this little countdown thing? It's very ominous. That was very ominous. Um, but yeah, I guess we can jump in. I'll introduce everyone. And I, I forgot to ask you, Cole, are you still, should I still reference your podcast? Are we still working on that? I wasn't sure. Oh, you're on mute. But you're on mute. Um, we're just we're still figuring out what that's gonna be. So okay. So should I should I refrain from mentioning it? Yeah, don't mention it. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. I don't want to like, you know, blow up your spot there. Yeah, I appreciate it though. Yep. Cool. Well, we can get started, and I have a little like little intro after I introduce you all, and we can jump right in. All right, this week on Left of the Projector, we are talking about the movie The Night of the Living Dead as part of the spooky month for Halloween season, although for me, all season, all year is spooky season. But we will be presenting this alongside another, a bunch of other horror and horror-adjacent films. And with me to discuss, I have Levi from Intervention Podcast, I have Red, and I have Cole. Thank you all for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. I think before we get into the movie and kind of my sort of first sort of curiosity that I'll, I'll share now, and then you can think about it while I kind of do a quick little opening. But I just want to, I'm curious what everyone sort of take on just kind of zombie in general, I guess, how you perceive them, like what's, what is a zombie? Because in different movies, especially this one, I feel like there's different interpretations of what they mean. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And I'm just going to give everyone a little bit of an intro about this movie and kind of some of the context, and then we can uh, get back to that question. But as I mentioned, The Night of the Living Dead was released in 1968 by George A. Romero. And while this wasn't the first zombie movie, uh, we can maybe look at this as the creation of the modern zombie genre. Uh, prior to this, we had movies like White Zombie, which is considered to be one of the first zombie movies, and I Walk with a Zombie, both from the early 20th century. And both of these are steeped in a lot of voodoo rituals from the time period. A lot of them take place in the Caribbean, Haiti, and other areas. So there's much different uh, kind of feel to these films, underlying tones of enslavement of indigenous people as part of the colonial project. And then bringing us to this Romero film, which was uh, created on a budget of just 120000 which netted him $30 million. The unfortunate piece to that is that he did not uh, do a good job with the publishing of this film rights and never had ownership. And then it went to the public domain, basically leaving him with very little to anything to show for this movie other than us here talking about it. And then lastly, before we get into it, I wanted to also note that Martin Luther King Jr. was shot on April 4th, 1968, which was actually the day after the filming of this movie concluded. So they were in their car going home and they learned about the shooting. And apparently, according to an article that Red sent me earlier, he noted, oh, no, this is good for us. And then on top of that, in 1967 is often referred to as the long, hot summer uh, related to the various riots and other civil disobedience as part of racial inequality in America. And then on top of that, the last thing, this was also the deadliest year in the space race with casualties on both sides, the USSR and the United States. And I think these both seem very important given the uh, first two characters we meet in this film are Barb, a white woman, and Ben, a black man. So it's kind of hard to separate the racial and other components of this movie so all that said anyone want to you don't have to necessarily answer my question you can say whatever you want so your question was basically our familiarity with zombies so I yeah actually... i guess like kind of how you perceive them either in this movie i guess would be a fair question given we're talking about this romero movie or just how you look at sort of like the jo the zombie creature in quotation marks so i'm in pittsburgh and i grew up in pittsburgh 
and I actually ran into either George Romero or Tom Savini at the Home Depot near my house uh, when I was growing up with my uncle. I was very young, and he told me not to bother him, that he was just, it, well, after pointing him out, he's just like a local celebrity that was incredibly approachable and non, you know, he didn't stand out in any way, shape, or form. He was just some old guy you would see in the neighborhood Home Depot or the neighborhood grocery store. So, cool. so growing up here, zombies were just a thing. They're just ubiquitous. You see them at every arts festival. You see them every Halloween. You see them every paintball arena always has zombie things around it. So I grew up with it just being so ubiquitous that I don't even know that I had a thought about it being something scary or something unusual until I was much older and realized that not everybody grew up surrounded by zombies. So I think my my view on zombies is incredibly uh, colored by that, in that I they're just they're home for me. <laughs> That's very nice. Nice. I was terrified um, of zombies me? growing up. Sorry, Cole. Don't mean to interrupt. No, go you. ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, the first zombie movie I ever saw, I don't remember what it is, but I remember. The imminent fear of zombies being in my house after that movie happening. And that went on for months. I was just, anytime I was alone, I was like, this is it. Um, I'm going to die here <laughs> from zombies. So this movie really encapsulated that fear again for me, which hasn't happened in a long time. And with like older horror films, I usually have a hard time feeling scared. Um, for a multitude of reasons, but like from the music to every way it was filmed. But I will say like specifically pertaining to the question, um, these zombies are a lot different, obviously, than how we see lots of more like modern horror per like pertain, like view zombies. Like um, they do things a lot more meticulously. Um even though they're not doing a lot of meticulous things, but like they grab items to use for like violence. Um, and I don't see that a lot in new newer movies. So that was interesting for me because I like, I had mentioned to you, Evan, I had seen this movie before, but I didn't really remember a lot of it. So it was kind of like I was watching it again for the first time today. Yeah, I, th I was going to say um, before you... Oh, go ahead. You go, go Cole. <laughs> uh, for me, like, zombies... Well, me and Evan did Dawn of the... Dead a few months back. And I tried to view that film as the zombies are the working class. Mm -hmm. um, this... Didn't really do that, because I think he was going for something different. A lot of the articles I was reading were saying that it was almost like a metaphor for, like, an older generation. And a new generation coming in. Um, and I think when we talked about Dawn of the Dead, um, it, it was almost like was reading De Boer's Society of the Spectacle right alongside it. I almost think for this film, he was reading, you know, gender, race, and class. <laughs> but a lot of the articles are just, he just said, you know, it wasn't about race. I wasn't trying to say anything political. I was just trying to look at best actors, and I don't know if that's... I don't know. What do you what do you all think about that? Do you think that's really what happened, or was he really trying to say something? Levi when I were discussing this a lot earlier today. I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy either. that he made this movie yeah. without a political thought like the, so just for anyone who doesn't know this the actor who played ben in this movie um is a black man but he wasn't wasn't written for a black person initially they just again like you said they picked the best person during auditions but we will probably have to get into this as they changed the ending of this movie from before the casting to later they uh, they changed well, the character of ben overall a lot yes he was originally written very rednecky like he uses aphorisms and mannerisms that you would associate with a country bumpkin kind of character so i think maybe to answer the question is maybe he initially sought out to make one movie 
And then when he found this great actor to fill this mm-hmm. role, he said, okay, I'm going to make another movie. And he made, he made a great, I mean, I think you said, right. It's like, it's not like modern zombies. And I think that what makes no. it so great oh, is yeah. that it's not the same fearful. You're not, the fear is different. Definitely. I mean, like, especially if you apply like a modern lens to it, like, I don't know if I'm the only person who still does this as an adult, but sometimes I watch movies and I'm like, what if this was me? What if I was in the movie? (laughs) Um, And, but in current day, and so like, there's a lot less zombies, but it feels like they're a lot more capable in certain ways. um, And they still have like, general whereabouts, uh, like, they for instance like ben goes into the cellar and like they just all know he's in the cellar um and like and a lot of more modern horror like zombies will very quickly be like if another loud noise happens they forget that this even happened so Mm. like there's lots of like very like humanizing aspects of the zombies which uh, yeah it does make it like a lot scarier and i also think makes it again like a lot more political i mean like all I think all zombie movies, again, have like an element of like the political nuance of it, of course, but very specifically when you humanize the zombie, it feels a lot more political. Yeah, and to Red's point, they were utilizing um, rocks and bludgeoning items, breaking windows. Uh, A lot of the zombies were quick. They were like at the beginning when that car handle i was terrified (laughs) yeah um and some in some zombie movies they just kind of meander around but pro zombie films it's like the zombies are like you know it's it's all about collective action with the zombies well that's actually so uh, did did we lose levi i'm here oh okay i just i i didn't that the i didn't see your video Apologies. Um, so what, what I was going to say was you mentioned collect. So b- let me let me sketch like a tiny bit of just the overall plot of this movie. It's not a very complex. There's really only two scene locations really in this entire movie. So the, the movie starts, you know, with an epic score. The The music in this movie is 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 fantastic. And you kind of have this very ominous opening with the, you know, the car driving down the road and it's a brother and a sister. And Barb and her brother, you know, are going to see their uh, father's grave and drop, you know, uh, you know, candy and this kind of arguing with each other. And immediately they're the brother. I'm now blanking on his actual name in the movie. Johnny. Johnny. Mm -hmm. Yes. Johnny. So he's telling, telling, you know, Johnny is really like ribbing her about, you know, being scared as a child. And then immediately we see the zombie coming through and it's it, it's like it, it, that part i feel like is actually very funny there isn't a lot in the movie that i feel like is that funny but the opening scene is pretty funny it like kind of cuts that very deep tension you're feeling and your brother you know falls hits his head presumably dead she you know scurries away gets into the car drops the brake finds a farmhouse and hides and that's kind of where you have the rest of the entire film as additional characters get kind of brought into this. But one of the things because you mentioned, Cole, the idea of like collective and individual, that's one theme I noticed throughout this movie is that Ben, who is the sort of the main male character in this uh, film, often is talking about how they need to work together. Whereas all of the other people in this movie specifically call out like, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to hide. We're going to do things ourselves on our own. And I feel like it very much encapsulates the one of the add-on themes to that of just sort of, you know, uh, American exceptionalism. We do things because we're Americans on our own versus the collective action of people as communist, leftist, Marxist, whatever you want to refer to. Love this. And so I felt that theme heavily throughout it. So, and I said a lot, so someone else can, (laughs) can chime in. Yeah. I just have, three quick things and then I'll address the individual versus collective. I think the first, and it's kind of hard to forget, or it's hard to remember that George Romero is only 28 years old when he makes this movie and he is an utter and complete nobody. He has no expectations to create this film. He's filming it 
and we're looking through the cast, a lot of them are just like the producer, or the executive producer, or their wife, and their actual kid, and you know the the boy Grip plays one of the zombies. It's just like it's a complete community <laughs> film. There are no, there's nobody in this movie. And the second, it's also hard to forget, hard to remember, that zombies <laughs> as a concept didn't really exist before this yeah. movie, at least as we understand them. So yeah. when we say that this is unusual, that we don't really see this in zombie movies, like nobody had seen this in zombie yeah. movies before because nobody was really watching zombie movies before this. Or I'm sure Evan knows more about this. They did <laughs> exist, but they were completely yeah, different. different. Yeah. And he doesn't use the word zombie in this movie or in describing this movie early on because it just didn't exist as a category. And Evan mentioned it, but I think it bears repeating that this movie had a script, but it went through, even at that time, it was considered an unusual number of rewrites on set. He was just completely rewriting scenes, rewriting direction, <laughs> rewriting concepts all the time. It sounds like it was utter chaos to be on this movie set. And it was filmed in how long? A couple weeks on top I of that? I think three weeks, something like that. Oh, wow. And it was originally going to be filmed in color, but they didn't have the money. So they started filming in black and white. And then they got the money, but then they decided to keep filming in black and white. <laughs> so I don't know that George Romero even remembers what he was thinking at that time as he was making it. It just sounds like it was utter chaos. That's fair. So on the indivi- Yeah. So on the individual and collective... You mentioned that Ben seems to be the most collectivist, and a lot of the time it does seem that way, but he's also the guy in charge. So he's interested mm. in collective as long as everybody agrees with him. He's not yeah. interested in following Mr. Cooper's rule. That's very true. But if everyone followed Mr. Cooper, we might say that they were collective behind Mr. Cooper. It's just that he's clearly the strongest character there. He's the Perfect. alpha character. I um I want to say to Barbara's character, Evan, you said there's like not much about the movie that's funny. Um, in a really sad way, Barbara's whole character was hilarious to me. <laughs> Just <laughs> she's doomed to have like the worst plot line. They treat her like hot garbage the whole movie. Um, she gets punched in the face, and I read lots of articles about this movie today, and not once did we talk about Barbara getting punched in the face. Um, so. It's like a little, it's just a little much. And like everybody's so quick to like yell at her for not knowing what's like going on when she's obviously in a state of shock. And I don't know. It's just, um, it was very funny to me in like a very sad way, but I couldn't help but laugh um, even after the part of like the beginning, which was like kind of, you know, a chuckle moment, but no, um, when she's like freaking out and then everyone's like, her brother died. I was I was losing it because I was like, oh, okay, so now it all makes sense why she's in shock. Not the the things or the monsters, you know. Her brother dying is the catalyst for all this, and that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all yeah. like she's not processing that her brother... Oh, yeah. Like, in the moment. she. I think she even says, like, near the end of the film, like, we got to go find Johnny because he's got the keys. Yep. You know, so, that's what's and really cool seeing, about the narrator. I don't want to like, I don't want to spoil anything, but like, yeah. And then seeing Johnny's reanimated body, yeah, wild. I can't imagine like seeing. I I was trying whenever this, I was like, can I put myself like in 1968? <laughs> Watch this without any other context, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think to just build off of what Red was saying, Barbara is this sort of like pathetic, sad character. But I mean, that's that's really us as the viewer. We're the stand in for Barbara. We're coming into this knowing oh, yeah. exactly as much as she does. In fact, all we know about the backstory of the zombie apocalypse is what she sees. So we're actually sympathizing with her because we know more about her than we know about any of the other characters. It takes her a long time to articulate. I actually don't know if she ever does that she's really. in such shock because she's been through actual loss. None of these other characters experience loss until the end. That's true. Right. To them, it's something that's outside of purview. It's like watching war on TV. Like, you know it's bad, but you haven't experienced it yet. That's so beautifully put. I I view Barbara so differently now. Um, 
I am Barbara is kind of what it feels like exactly what you said. So, I mean, just to be put in that situation of you're in shock, you meet a random person in this house you're hiding in, and he basically just starts ordering you around. <laughs> yeah. Like, get some nails, start hammering, sit on the wall. <laughs> what are you waiting for? And it's, it's, I can understand being like, being very off put. And then I, I sort of, I noted that she wasn't helping, but then she does like try and help. And I, and I think, you know, looking back on it, you think yourself probably being busy helps you, you know, avoid having to process these things. But instead she's just kind of catatonic on the couch, just unable to articulate or, or anything. I mean, none of them really have any understanding of what's going on. I mean, it seems to have no. just begun. And we, the only information that, which I think I also want to talk about, I think one of my favorite aspects of the movie that comes into play in other Romero films later on, Dawn of the Dead and so on, is the news and radio broadcasters, yeah. I think play such a like pivotal role in this movie. And I love yeah. how it worked. And actually a weird thing I'll mention, which is why I asked if, I want to um, play a clip for people from the movie is a lot of that part wasn't in the script for some reason. Every script I found didn't include mm -hmm. all of the uh, TV commentator for some reason. I don't know if it's, I couldn't find any reason for that, but I don't know what anyone else thought about the, the, like the radio and the TV introduction. And also maybe I think the first thing we hear is that they're like violent murderous killers. That's the, yeah the connotation and kind of what everyone maybe takes that to mean. Cause I think Romero, the guy who says this movie isn't political was clearly making political statements in 1967, oh, yeah. 68. I kind of relating back to Barbara again, sorry, but it, it's important. I think to the point of the radio in that, um, she like doesn't believe that Johnny's dead. Well, he has the keys, you know. And then she's sitting there, and the radio is like, it's on obviously, but it it starts being louder than the rest of the background noise, and um, it starts talking specifically about like if you have been killed by one of these murderers, then you are going to then turn into one. It doesn't sp explicitly say that. It says they're flesh eating. Sorry, and. It like the way it pans in on her face, it's it obviously is not said, but the implication I got anyway was that she was in that moment kind of accepting like, oh, Johnny has been eaten. Um, he's dead. And so that was one of like the biggest moments for me where the radio was actually helping these people understand what was going on, because for the most part, they're listening to the radio a lot, but it also felt like it wasn't really impacting a lot of their movements. I know they were trying to make decisions based on the radio, but they were just having a broader conflict about staying in the the cellar or not um, versus like actually taking advice from the radio. Um, and just quickly to the point of, you know, the political part of um, referring to them as like murderers. Um, I think, again, it's like very intentional. It's really hard to watch this movie and believe that nothing about this was like this was an accident and you know because like watching it today it's like every part of it i'm like wow there's lots of statements being made here <laughs> um so like it's really hard to believe that there it was none of it was on purpose yeah the radio plays a really interesting role because i think the first time that they even or the second time they talk about the radio because the first time is in the car and johnny's fiddling with it and yeah. says he gets it to work but nothing is actually stated at that point is when they're boarding up the windows and ben finds the radio and turns it on and the radio basically says like stay in place board up the windows and he's and all this response is like well sounds like we're right on track we're doing good mm. it's like he's looking for affirmation from the radio they don't like to red's point they don't ever seem to be looking for advice from the radio the radio always seems to be one step behind the information they've already figured out. Yeah. I was going to say when they finally find the TV, I laughed so hard <laughs> when they're, when they're following the doctor, <laughs> the science military general for answers. And none of them are just like, no, no. And then I think the doctor lets it slip. Like it's totally because they were talking about the satellite was shot down because it got too mm -hmm. close to a I don't remember what planet it was Venus yeah and they said it was full of radiation 
and uh, the military, like, he's like, oh, they're totally connected. And the military looks over like, he's like, oh, no, we, we might not, they're, it might not be connected. I just was laughing so hard. I was like, nothing, see how the government dealt with COVID, so. I also love that you could totally tell that they had no money to film that scene, because there's tons of people just, like, walking around in the background, complete non plus <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That that was that was the scene that actually that scene. So the TV part is in the script until. So the part that's in the script is them describing everything, and then they have the interview of the sheriff, or the you know in the local area. Which I also, since we're talking about the TV and the radio, I think is also worth talking about. And then the part with the the you know the NASA and all the radiation is not in the script, for some reason. But I think that it was. What's that? Really? That's surprising. It, it, it it's is. very weird. And I looked at three or four different versions that I could find online, and they're all exactly the same, did not have it. But well, I think the part where they bring in the interview, like they like the, in the description in the, in the TV is basically like, you know, we're rolling a pre-recorded clip. And they go out to, I think his name is uh, Sheriff C- Conan McClelland. And he's basically telling this female reporter like, oh, yeah, we have this under control. We can Mm -hmm. do it in a day or so. You know, we just have to, you know, we just have to kill them and, you know, burn their bodies. And it's like very matter of fact. We got this under control. Like local communities got this. But they don't realize how fucked they are. Oh, yeah. I I noticed that when he said, yeah, you know, the boys are taking it well. (laughs) (laughs) Think about... Nothing about the community, how the community is doing, how many people are still with us. Just, no, oh, the boys are taking it well. We, we put 19 of them down. It's like, okay. Yeah. I feel like that's like, honestly, it's like you said, it's still on par, <laughs> like the news today. So it, it's very <laughs> hilarious. It, it feels like it's meant to be kind of like uh, mocking the news a little, which I don't know if that's intentional, but that's definitely the feeling I got. I feel like mocking of the news, that might be intentional, because I guess the only person in the film that had any name recognition when the movie was made is the TV presenter himself, was Bill Chili Billy Cardiel, and he (laughs) had a nightly Pittsburgh TV horror presentation show. So he would have been a local celebrity at that time. And so him being a serious TV reporter, local people seeing that would have recognized that as being ridiculous. That's funny. I didn't know that. That's that's very, that's pretty funny. And I, I see, I think you're right. I think too, I think I was looking at some article. I was reading a bunch. I don't remember which one it was. I'll put some of them in the notes. But one of them was saying how in each of his films, number one, they all seem to come out about every 10 years, kind of commenting on a different era and they all use media in some way, in some sense. I think either it's to be like mocking or just to, to show that everyone thinks, you know, if it, they see it on TV and everyone is calm, everything is actually fine. But I think at the end of the day, you know, they don't know what's going on and they don't know yeah. what to do and they have no idea what to tell people. They change, stay inside, go to our, you know, our uh, support centers, you know, leave your house, you know, all these different directions because they just don't know. I I wanted to touch a little bit back on to the point of like um, individualism within the movie. Like um, when I do make online content, I talk a whole lot about an individualism and like a strange labor by Marx. Um, and that is something that I really, I hated in this movie. Um, but also I didn't even think about Levi's point that was like, Ben had all of the control and honestly he was very like demanding of everybody to just like do what I say which the stakes are kind of high so like I kind of get being so like we don't really have time to like fuck around like let's do this quickly please but um I also probably would be hesitant in that moment to be like yeah let's just listen to Ben because like do like do we really know if Ben is right like do we and honestly like Ben I won't spoil it, but you know, like, come on. We, we so. can, we can spoil. You can spoil it. I mean, there's spoilers, uh, Ben yeah. was not right. Not that there was really necessarily like a great situation, like, but Ben wasn't like didn't do the best thing. Not that again, Mr. Cooper didn't have the right idea, and I didn't either. He wanted to go die with his daughter in the cellar, 
but like not me so and ben neither yeah i mean that's the the great contradiction of the film is that's the argument is whether they should stay upstairs where ben wants yeah. to be and ben is the hero and it's hiding in the basement that ends up uh kind of saving his life at least until he goes outside yeah one thing i was oh, i just had a thought were you saying you're saying right about the him being right i'll think of it in a minute i thought tom uh -huh. was actually tom was trying to diffuse like hey we yeah. we need to work together you guys have valid points like the cell like we can defend it up here. I thought he was the one that was like, "Hey, like, <laughs> you guys obviously don't like each other, but we got to work together." <laughs> Tom was as relatable as Barbara. Like, mom and dad are fighting, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, I know what I was going to mention is I, I feel like this movie brought in because it's the creator, like the founding piece of art on the kind of like modern zombie. I think it's so amazing that he thought to include the idea of like hiding the bite on the child you know, yes. in the basement, which is like a trope in like walking, you, you name mm -hmm. the movie, name, name the show about zombies, like, oh, we have to check for bites. And like the idea that that, they never mentioned that on the TV. That's a thing that they had no insight on is like how it's being actually being spread. And unfortunately that leads to some a pretty, you know, one of the very most gruesome scenes in this movie. There isn't a lot of violence. You know, maybe there's different kind of violence. You know, this isn't a bloody movie. A lot of the um, shots of Ben, like, killing the, you know, the zombies is not shown, you know, money-wise. I'm sure that was, there's no, but I, I just, I just, my observation of that is just Romero is a genius. Yeah, it's, it's kind of incredible how fully formed the genre comes out of Romero's head in this movie. Mm -hmm. but he wasn't trying to do anything he just yeah you know, <laughs> 26 years old he writes the script or whatever it's, it's fresh out of film school just got fi uh finished filming mr rogers neighborhood decided he wanted to strike out on his own so i think going back to tom I think he's like a really interesting character and I'm not entirely sure what to think of him because he's shown as being like the guy that's trying to bridge the gap between the two with Mr. Cooper being the older and Ben clearly being the younger. And it's Tom that really seems to screw up the whole plan that they come together with. Even though Tom is the one that makes it, he for some reason sets the gasoline on fire as it, it I was really unclear on what he did that really just screwed that up uh. so badly. Ben left the torch next to the truck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. At myself, so when I, on the second watch, I was like, okay, what happens? And he sets the torch down, and then uh, when he goes to fuel up the truck, the gas all over, it starts on fire. So it was it's just really poor ball. planning, a lot of adrenaline going through people, and yeah, I could have gone a whole lot better. <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is that, you know, you had an unexpected person kind of foil the plan for the last minute, you know, jumping in the car. Yeah. And anytime you have, anytime you see, like, I feel like, again, like a trope of zombie movies now is, you know, you have a plan to do something and then something gets changed at the last minute. I feel like the same kind of thing happens in Dawn of the Dead where they're trying to block off the shopping mall and, you know, they, they change something at the last minute and then things go awry. So. Mm -hmm that screws up their plan and also you have to think about like they're under pressure they're stressed i mean you know i don't it's dark. yes it's ben's fault but yeah it's dark i mean yes it's ben's fault but the light the power had the power already gone out at this point when they go go outside it had no it hadn't yet i don't think it had quite yet i know it goes out at one point which i think is also you know the power grids down they're all i will say that even though like I am making lots of jokes that it was all Ben's fault. It really, I don't think it really was. Um, yeah. Like, to Barbara with Johnny, you know, losing Johnny and watching him get eaten. Ben watched, like, a whole restaurant full of people get eaten right before he had ended up at this house. So, like, even if he wasn't close to them, he still also was, like, in a state of shock. And presumably he was trying much harder than Barbara to, like, get it together and save not only his life, but now her life. 
and then all of these other people's lives that like slowly enter the picture so he was trying his best um with very little resources so yeah yeah it's it's just interesting in that moment when they have a plan and they begin executing it i mean you even have mr cooper cooperating you have the woman and the man making the molotov cocktails it's just like it's a moment of calm actually in the movie mm. i mean i think mr cooper says that he's not sure it's going to work but he does seem to be committed to doing his part i mean he does yeah. it competently everyone does it to a point but then it just all falls apart and that's when really i think the that's like the emotional nadir of the movie where everything sort of goes downhill from there there's no other positive aspects to the movie after that point no. they're all at no. each other's throats yeah, that's true. That is actually the one moment where they kind of, I mean, Ben has had other moments too, where he learns like they're afraid of fire and he lights yeah. the couch on fire and throws it outside. Like all of the things they seem to be doing like are planned out and they seem thoughtful, but you know, best laid plans. I don't know what the saying is, you know, something, something it, <laughs> they have these plans, but it doesn't always work out in your favor. Yeah. I know we just said I'd... how Romero came up with the zombie genre completely formed, but I think we also started this by saying the things that were really unique. And I think one of the things that's relatively unique, and I haven't seen a ton of zombie movies, but the zombies are capable of expressing fear. Like they are afraid of fire. Mm -hmm. And that's not something you really associate in the zombie genre as the zombies having any emotional connection to anything whatsoever. And I just yeah. thought that was a really unique and telling aspect of the care of the ghouls as he calls them yeah i guess that puts it back on sort of the like the kind of the opening thought is how you know you cole you mentioned like in the other movie it's kind of like the working class or the zombies and this they're kind of like this i don't, I don't even really know how I, even to this point i don't really even know how i would categorize what they are whether i mean from the the radio broadcast the first thing i think i already mentioned is it comes to my mind is uh maybe i'll re read the part that i'm talking about um let me see if i can find the exact spot because they're talking about how they're you know oh it says so the radio announcer says uh, the strange beings have appeared in most parts of the nation they seem to have certain predictable patterns of behavior uh, apparently their deranged attacks on the lives of people taken completely off guard and establish that alien beings are human in many physical and behavioral aspects. Hypotheses as to their origin as uh, varied and diverse, and they're uh, they're aggressive. They are corpses, and I think there's one. And then they're infiltrating urban and rural areas throughout the nation. And I feel like that line itself was sort of a, a, a interesting. Whether it's infiltrating of like communism into america given the cold war era mm. or could it have been sort of like the idea of integration the possibility mm. of black people integrating into your white you know neighborhood and i, I don't know I, I maybe i'm reading too much into the the radio i'm trying to find the other piece they mention um i think that was the big line that i was thinking of they're weak in physical strength but they're distinguishable because of their appearance um they specifically mentioned they can handle weapons. Like you mentioned, they have the ability to use things. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. When I heard the original radio where they talk about them being in urban areas and to be safe in cities, it just really reminded me of the fact that this is 1967. And a lot of the radio news is going to be talking about the riots that are happening in sizable cities. Uh, they yep. wouldn't happen in Pittsburgh itself until 1968, so it's a little bit later than after this movie is made. But that is happening. That's what the news is reporting on, is to be aware that if you're in urban centers, you could be caught in one of these riots, and it could be the end of days for you. Yeah, I think the long, hot summer, which is referred to as that year, 1967, I was looking at the... I have the Wikipedia page open. I think they said there was something like how many different, 150 different race riots across the country in a single year, which is hard to really kind of wrap your head around that in a number of places. And they show all the different cities and it really is varying from places you would see as like the deep South to major cities. And, and so 
no one was safe in a sense. So I feel like that mm. may be playing off the idea just that no matter where you are, you can't really be safe from whatever the th- it is. The threat. You, you, the threat. Yeah, you mentioned it's it's sort of hard to wrap your mind around, but I mean, we kind of went through it already with the George Floyd riots, although this yeah, would have been true. sustained for many years. And we understand how Fox News describes urban downtown centers. Yeah. So I think we, we actually do have a pretty good grasp on how people were thinking of urban centers at this moment, especially the affluent white people that would have been in the suburbs or the exurbs, which is where this movie takes place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point that you say that as you think. I have friends who you know live in very suburban areas and they'll often say like oh you live in a in a city like do you have like are you afraid of like getting stabbed like i heard there was a shooting like is this near you and of course it's not it's like a one-off kind of thing and i think there very much is perpetuated by you know fox news this particular individual is more right-leaning as maybe given that they're kind of buying into this fear of crime waves and modern violence and i think it's very coded towards you know minorities of whatever you know group you want to pick for the week for them i think that oh i'm go go ahead no you go ahead i was just gonna say that um like on the topic of fear um i love zombie movies and the analysis of like politics and then because um and kind of adding to the point also there's not lots of violence in the movie like we mentioned but one of the like only scenes of like gore um i guess i would reference from the movie is um ben uses oh uh, man tool he uses a man tool (laughs) and he uh (laughs) he bashes a zombie in the head um and it like pans in on this like little red hole in the head and um to the point of like white americans being inundated by fear of like a looming specter of uh like right now um kind of communism again you know we're kind of you know back in our cold war era so but like you know whether it's been like uh, immigration um or the you know the lack of fear of COVID consider like depending on what political group you belong to. Um, I really, I think this is like, it's encapsulated well in this movie and the only like specific note of violence uh, really reflected that for me. I don't even know what we were talking about and it may not be pertaining (laughs) to what we were, but anyway, that was my thought. (laughs) Did you have something Levi? I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. Just to build off of that sort of impending sort of, feeling of fear. I think you actually mentioned this at the top, Evan, but this was only five years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when people truly believed that the United States was within imminent nuclear annihilation. Um, And historically, we now know that to be true, uh, that the United States was almost wiped off the map. So this would have been in the forefront of people's minds. And this is the as Evan definitely mentioned, the height of the space race. People were thinking Mm -hmm. in terms of the United States versus the Soviet Union. And this was an era, or this year specifically, 1967, was a particularly deadly year for the space race. A lot of people died. And it was before the sort of moon landing of 1969. So people didn't actually know where this sort of thing was going. They didn't know that they were just about to reach the moon. They could have assumed that they were going to have more dead astronauts on their hands. And that's where you get that one scene that seems to be sort of added in, not found in any of the scripts where the space uh, satellite to Venus is shown to be a potential source for all of this anxiety, for all of this fear, for all of this, um, you know, the zombies themselves. And that's directly tied to the Soviet Union, United States rivalry Mm -hmm. that they've gone too far. Let me see if I can try to play it. I had it queued up. Let me see if this will work. Because I have it like cued right to that exact moment. I think it's interesting. Why are space experts being consulted about an earthbound emergency? So far, 
All the betting on the answer to that question centers on the recent Explorer satellite shot to Venus. That satellite, you'll recall, started back to Earth, but never got here. That's the space vehicle which orbited Venus and then perp was purposely destroyed by NASA when scientists discovered it was carrying a mysterious high-level radiation with it. Could that radiation be somehow responsible for the wholesale murders we're now suffering? So, I, I mean, it's hard to think of that clip in, in without that, you know, space race context, like that NASA's no. at the forefront of all the things that are happening. I, I cut it, but there's the next part is the scene we were laughing about earlier with like this, the, you know, the scientists are getting into the car, like being like, no comment. And then like <laughs> spilling all the beans at the same time. But <laughs> anyone, anyone out there can watch this movie fully on YouTube. There's color version, black and white version, multiple versions, but I think it's true. And see, this is an area where I actually would say that I could believe that Romero didn't fully intentionally, he intentionally put that in the script, obviously. But I feel like everyone was living this, it's hard to imagine what it would have been like to live in this era when they were doing, you know, drills in school to hide under the desk because of a threat of like the bomb, knowing that they had just been 20 years from seeing the bomb being detonated in Japan. So I could see like that fear permeating people and I feel like if you watched this movie in the theater at the time, I feel like that would have been like the ultimate layer of just fear on top of. Oh, yeah. So you have people that could eat you, mm -hmm. eat your flesh, and then you also have the possibility of just being, you know, nuked at any moment. <laughs> it's, it's just like this perpetual state of fear, plus the riots. I mean, God, the, the 60s were crazy. There's a really fun quote that I always go to to try to encapsulate just how ridiculous the language was around the space race, the missile race, the just the Soviet-American conflict. And it's Nikita Khrushchev, and he's been told that President Kennedy has said, I believe that the United States has the weapons capacity to destroy the Earth seven times, and the Soviet Union only has the weapons capacity to destroy the Earth five times. And he responds, yes, I know what Kennedy claims, and he's quite right. But I'm not complaining. We're satisfied to be able to finish off the United States the first time around. Once is enough. What good does it to annihilate a country twice? We're not a bloodthirsty people. <laughs> and I think that directly connects to like uh, Dr. Strangelove, that the rhetoric was just so incredibly extreme that if you just take it on its face, it really was ridiculous. Why should we care that we can destroy the planet multiple times? You only need to do it <laughs> once. But that was... That was the discourse. That was the missile gap. That was Kennedy claiming that the United States wasn't ready to face the Soviet Union because we couldn't mm. destroy the Earth more times than them. <laughs> yeah. The whole, that whole thing. Yeah, well, you, it's funny you mentioned Dr. Strangelove. We were also discussing earlier, I wonder what kind of impact that movie had. It came out in 1964, uh, about four years before he filmed this movie. And I found on Wikipedia that it's actually in Romero's top 10 most influential films of his life was Dr. Strangelove. So uh, you'll actually find an episode on that film soon after you are listening to this on this podcast. But I think it's there. There is like a link between that with that, like fear of the bomb. And that movie is obviously like satire, whereas this movie is not. This is like playing on the fear like mm -hmm. more so whereas dr strangelove is like oh haha ha, the bomb it's really funny we're gonna just joke <laughs> about it when this it's it's like the the subtext there and i don't know i never really noticed the radiation thing as carefully when i watched this movie you know years ago whenever i you know the last time i'd seen it like this time i obviously am taking notes and looking into it but i feel like it's very interesting mm. That's such a poor descriptor. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Well, yeah, I'll repeat. So. <laughs> I think it's interesting, the comparison to Dr. Strangelove, in that the satire is far more straightforward in that movie. We kind of know where he stands and what to think about it. Whereas with this Romero movie, I guess you could potentially call it a satire. You could call it clearly a political movie but even that we're having a hard time grappling with exactly what represents what 
and I don't know what to make of that other than it's just a great movie. It accomplishes being a thought piece while still being scary and titillating, and it hits all the right notes. It's like the origin story, you know, kind of thing where people who are filmmakers, aspiring filmmakers, saw this movie and probably thought, like, you know, they may have, they may not even have seen the earlier zombie movies. Like White Zombie is one of the credited as one of the first ever zombie movies. I think it came out in 1934. Four. I'll have to look that up, fact check myself. But you know, they watched those movies and they thought they see Romero's movie and it, like it it spawned so many iterations. And I think that Romero also said that his inspiration was uh, I Am Legend, which makes a lot of sense. Which is a much different type of zombie movie than this. I don't know if anyone has read or seen it, but it's a lot different than this kind of, you know. I guess that's the thing. Zombies existed. They just didn't exist in the film. I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah, I, I think just to one point on sort of an aside that you made that this is sort of the fountainhead of this concept of the zombie movie. But the thing is, I, I would still argue that on top of that, it's just a good movie. Because when we think of something like the first opera by the pretty things, it's called Sorrow. Like nobody really listens to it because it's not that good. Like they were groundbreaking, but that doesn't mean that it's any good. Whereas this movie, I would argue, is just it's good. It's worth watching. Mm -hmm. And it's free on top of that, which is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just as an aside, so I am legend the book came out in nineteen fifty four. So about fifteen years before this. And also again, Cold War era to I think you know, he didn't Oh, now that I think about it, I wonder if what aspects were kind of pulled from that because we're talking about how he kind of brought these things to film. But some of those ideas, I guess, were like out there, like in the ether in some sense. He just, like you said, Levi, he made a, a great movie regardless of whether it's about vamp vampires, zombies, you know, whatever. It's another thing. And actually, that actually brings me to a thing that I've been meaning to mention. I don't remember if we talked about this, Cole, when we did Dawn of the Dead is there was a um, a cracked article from 2011 that compared vampire and zombie movies depending upon whether there's a democrat or a republican in the white house and it's very interesting <laughs> to see that there is it's not the best correlation like if you were doing this in like statistics you'd kind of maybe laugh it off but there mm -hmm. is definitely more zombie movies when there are republicans in office and i don't remember who i mentioned this mm. to earlier is that I feel like the reason we don't see that many left-leaning zombie movies is because it's kind of like a Republican right-wing fantasy to be in like this an apocalyptic... This is the wet dream of a Republican man. <laughs> yes, like you've stored all your food and you're, you know... Well, go ahead, Cole, I saw... Oh, I was going to say, yeah, this is... Rights Amendment, gun nuts, uh... <laughs> White white rural men love this shit. But I think Ben said it, though. At the, we have to get somewhere where there's other people. So all of your human arguments go out the window because it's all about <laughs> being collective. <laughs> well, the, was I going to mention that? I think that maybe brings us... I mean, we should definitely talk about the ending of this movie. Oh, yeah. And I think we should also talk yeah. about the original ending when Levi sent me, I couldn't find it. But Levi sent me the, I guess it's like the original script draft before Ben was, uh, I guess as a black person, as opposed to, you know, presumably a white person. Mm -hmm. But I think that the zombie fantasy before we jump into that is just the idea. Actually, they're kind of like, here's my segue is that the idea of in both th this movie, the Dawn of the Dead is this like roving group of white militia offshoot KKK-esque, especially in the 1960s, you know, kind of going around killing people for sport. And yes, they're zombies, but we know who they probably would like to be killing. Yeah. And I go ahead, Levi. Yeah, I think I have a comment that actually really well. So we were talking about rural white men loving this stuff and it has like a very libertarian vibe to it. Yeah. 
around here where I talked about at the beginning that this is just like second nature. Everyone thinks about zombies. It's in the local culture. There are zombie preparedness gun clubs. Uh, they claim to be tongue in cheek, but they reference this movie and they reference that posse that we need to be getting these people together. I mean, it's so much part of the culture that I believe the state of Pennsylvania had an emergency preparedness for a zombie apocalypse that had to do with organizing local militias because they knew it was something that people would be interested in and would bite on. So it really does speak to uh, this area in a way that a lot of this libertarian stuff probably flies all over the country. Just It's just directly coded in zombie language around here. That's kind of terrifying. <laughs> That's both doesn't surprise me but also is terrifying yeah <laughs> at the same time but yeah so the, so as for the ending of this movie we have you know everyone has now succumbed to either death through being bitten in the basement or they've been you know outside of the outside of the farmhouse and the only person at this point that is left is Ben and he again like we said before eventually hides in the in the cellar because that's his only recourse. And the thing that I wasn't clear about, maybe someone else can, what they thought is eventually they all leave the farmhouse or they leave. They're, they're kind of all trying to get into the basement and then they all leave. Is it because they hear the roving group of people outside? Is there, maybe everyone can, can give their theory on that. I don't think it was clear, at least even in like this, like the direction of the movie. And then Ben comes out, you have the same sheriff from earlier, that was talking about how it's like they're going around killing zombies and they're killing them, setting up a fire to burn the bodies. And Ben creeps out of the, you know, I guess I could, maybe I should read the, um, like the stage direction of it. I thought it was, it's pretty depressing, but he comes out and they are talking to each other about having to shoot them in the head because that's the only way to get them. And they see him moving. He's holding the shotgun in his hand and they just pull the trigger, shoot him in the head. And then as the credits are starting to roll, you see them building the fire and they hook his body and they throw it on top of the fire. And I don't know how you can't look at this when without they, kind of lynching. Yeah. yeah, when they showed the like meat hooks, the butcher meat hooks, I was like, I was, it was really sad to watch. Yeah. And then the way it's all presented, it's sort of shown as snapshots, mm -hmm. which somehow make it feel even more like a yeah. modern lynching because you think of the souvenirs people took. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and then the, the... Oh, go ahead, Levi. Oh, I was just going to say, in terms of theory about what's going on, time is like a really strange thing in this movie because you appear to be with them the entire time and you don't see breaks where time appears to have passed, but time is clearly passing because in the beginning of the movie, it's daylight. And by the end of the movie, it's daylight of the next morning. Yeah. So I wasn't sure how much time actually passed with Ben in the basement. They may have just True. lost interest. Time might have passed. It might have been hours. We, we really, it could have been days. We have no idea, really. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a, you know, shoestring budget. They're just trying to get, you know, have to get to the end of the movie. But the um, in the original script, both Barb and Ben are the are survivors within the mm. the farmhouse, and um, I didn't read through the whole thing. I think Levi, you might have read through it, but I think they convinced them that you know that they're that they're alive, and I think the very last line. Well, oh, so. Ahead. Barb is in the basement, and at this point in the movie, she's just apparently catatonic. Like, she's no longer speaking or communicating in any way, shape, or form after everybody's been eaten alive. But Ben is still active, and he goes up, he goes to the window, and he's still shot in the head. And the police, or the sheriff, and they think they've killed a zombie. And they go to the basement, and they find Barb sitting motionless yeah. in the chair, and they think she's a zombie as well, and they're about to kill her, but then they see that she's crying, and they realize that the zombies don't cry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when they sit down and convince her to speak, and that's when she tells them that Ben was alive. 
And so the, the ending the of the movie is very like, different. Yeah. And the last line is the sheriff says, it's too bad, an accident. The only loss we had the whole night, which I feel like is a much different ending. Like, I don't, that, I don't, I don't want to see that movie. Like, that's... No. That's not a good movie. I mean, that's not the movie. You know, like, the movie they made... That, that's why it's also impossible to say, like, Romero didn't mean what he was doing at the end yeah. of this movie. Like, this, that was his original ending, and this is what he came up with. I think that's, yeah. like, an excellent point, honestly. Like, if he was not making a political point at all, the movie, I, in my opinion, would be hard to watch because, like, given the time and the fact that the lead role is a black man and he's not casted in some awful light, which was very consistent for the time, if you were a black person being casted in any role and especially, like, even to this day in horror roles. I mean, that's changed a lot, but it's still pretty consistent, especially if you have, like, white people writing and producing and directing and what have you. But, um, like, the fact that he changed the entire ending of the movie and the snapshots, again, like, it's very clearly supposed to evoke an uncomfortableness from a white audience of, like, yeah, this is, like, very clearly supposed to emulate, um, like, the feelings that you would from a lynching so i there's again like we've said it so many times but there's no way that this was just all by pure chance and accident yeah one of the the notes in wikipedia you mentioned like of a white audience watching this is i think that the when it was released in uh october 1968 apparently it kind of it attracted you know horror audiences and like teens and whatnot and it seemed like people were not prepared for the movie that they got like horror movies oh. before this were not like this that's why i feel like the movie is so timeless and so amazing is that the like the emo emotion that it can evoke then in the 1960s now you know it's like i, I hate to use like the cliche but it's like a timeless movie it, it, you know Every article I read was like kind of like poo pooing the budget. With a bigger budget, you don't have a better movie. I mean, mm. no. Um, the fact that the the makeup was like there wasn't much makeup on the. I almost thought that was scarier because they looked more yeah. like people. Um, they said that they got a lot of the the parts that the zombies were eating from like. The... <laughs> I, I don't I think if you're trying to make prosthetics, I it doesn't look the same. <laughs> Even in black and white, I don't know. What do you guys That was one of the most actually the, the one of like the one gross scene of the entire movie is when they're in the field eating. Yep. Bones. Eating like that yeah. is really And it's like obvious they're eating like big ass turkey legs. <laughs> like it's pretty clear it's like yeah. a turkey leg, but it's still really uncomfortable. And I have read an article today talking about like some audiences actually find again the humanization of the zombies, like the ghouls, sorry, let me stay in theme. Um very uncomfortable because it's just like a little bit of makeup, but I I like that call because I did not feel that way actually. That's one of the reasons why watching older horror films is kind of hard for me because I'm like, okay, like this is not like what I'm used to. Like even like I grew up in like, you know, 80s horror. Um, still like I can watch it to bed because it's not it's not gonna spook me. Yeah, uh Red touched on it, but I, I think it bears investigation or conversation here, but We've mentioned it in passing, but the sound in this movie is just so incredible. The music at the beginning, the way it sort of morphs into electronic distortion. I mean, when the little girl is murdering the mother, it becomes this like echoed, ridiculously synthetic yeah. scream. <laughs> and it's just so unsettling. Yes. And it's kind of hard to remember that that technology at that point would have been considered avant-garde. That would have uh -huh. been considered unheard of you wouldn't have seen a movie like that so not only are the visuals sort of disturbing but the sound itself is just so unique 
And I think it has to be remembered that that's something else that Romero also brought to the genre that was you that wasn't done before. Yeah, it, as a, as just a, like a note on how they came about some of the music in this movie. Apparently, he um, asked a friend or hired this guy named Carl Hardman to do the score, and apparently, his company to save on money because they couldn't use actual songs. He had a like a database of like records of just sounds it was just literally like things being scratched like asmr like this is what they were using (laughs) to create you know the soundtrack of this but he took these like random sounds and he turned them into like a horrifying soundtrack and apparently a lot of this this is the kind of stuff that gets used in like b-level horror because they can't afford licensing you know for uh for a thing and i feel like this soundtrack is I just did an episode, and you'll also hear on uh, The Shining, and I feel like Stanley Kubrick directly is using the kind of sound in this. And on that episode, the one of the guests referred to it as um, like holding a microphone up to a microwave and just like listening to the sounds that like it's making, just like vibrations, scratching, yeah. like, static. It's just it like tingles your brain in this like weird way that I can't describe. <laughs> all the hums and the buzzes that were going on in this film. It was, yeah, it's nostalgic. I don't know how else to put it. And just to build off of Cole's claim that this wouldn't be better with more money, it's almost as though it's better because it didn't have a budget. Yeah. Like you're mentioning Carl exactly. Hardman who made them. You're mentioning Carl Hardman who made the music. He was also Mr. Cooper. Like these people were double yeah, shifting sorry, on absolutely shocked. everything. <laughs> yeah. That 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 would that was a good note I should have included. That's cool. There. <laughs> yeah, it says everything in it. He was the producer and worked for like a um I don't he says he was like uh but I don't know exactly what company he worked for, but it was something that involved music and they just this was just stuff like lying around in like a storage room of just a bunch of like records that had <laughs> these sounds on it. I don't know how long it took them to produce the soundtrack after. I didn't see anything on that, but it's just, I love, I love horror soundtracks in general. I find them always to be really, especially on like low budget one, you know, movies, I think of eighties horror to the low budget horror movies that are just, you don't need, you know, rock and roll music and, you know, the Eagles playing in the background or something. I mean, I guess it's like a modern movie maybe, but you know, I don't know why they're just the Eagles. forced to be that much more resourceful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, you're trying. You like the way you build that movie is just like, you know, just sweat and you know time. I read, just... I read so many articles that just dis- they kept describing it as guerrilla filmmaking, <laughs> which kind of warmed my heart to hear, honestly. But no, but yeah, just kind like of just use what love. you use what you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Use what you. And there's yeah, articles that talk about how Romero, he continued to make movies, and I guess he worked in Hollywood at some point, but he just, it said it was a criticism on one of the articles saying that he just like never learned how to use any of the modern methods. He was always chaotic on scene, always doing rewrites, and he specifically said that he was always writing in the marginalia of scripts rather than doing reprints. And I I think it says like in a sort of passing backhanded way that even after 10 years, he was still doing this. But that is so endearing. Like he was just interested in the art. He had no interest in learning all of the bells and whistles of Hollywood. And part of that charm is he also continued to make his movies in Pittsburgh until very near to his death. I mean, he never changed the the situation. He stayed here. Yeah. They're they're releasing a new and the the I think supposedly the final entry in his, you know, series is uh, I, I, he obviously has no part of the script, you know, because he's since passed. But apparently, it's going to be the I think survival of the dead might have been the last one, which I actually haven't mm. seen. So I think they're going to make one more. They've already started filming it, I believe, or they were going to start filming it, something like that. So, but you're right. I feel like shunning Hollywood and making the movie you want to make. It's really just like giving the finger to them because like after this movie, he probably could have gotten funding to make, when I say big budget, you know, a couple million dollars to make something. Yeah. But he didn't want to make that movie. He wanted to make 
this movie, and you got to give him respect for that. It's revolutionary. I mean, like, he literally said this movie in that New York Times article quote. He wanted it to be revolutionary. Like, I think just constantly resisting the money and a bigger production and, like, yeah, learning the technology and adhering to more, like, practical, quote-unquote, and normalized standards. But not doing all of that is incredibly radical. Yeah, and I think when I mentioned like the the you know the right wing fantasy of zombie movies, I don't really feel like this is one of the few mm-hmm. movies I can even think of where there is like any leftist politics in zombie movies. Yeah. I made like a list recently of like kind of the top five zombie movies. There really aren't other than his movies. There's only a few other films that I can think of that are actually, you know, have that bend to them. Blood Quantum is one. If anyone out there likes a a modern zombie movie, I would highly recommend it. It takes place on like an Indian or sorry, Native American indigenous reservation. Hmm. But I know he's gotten a lot of other like later in his life, he got a lot of directors and big name artists to participate in his movies mm-hmm. that he just like had that sway, he had that authenticity to him that people would work for him for free, basically. I know Guillermo del Toro, uh, Simon Pegg. Um, I can't think of any of the other names offhand, but I wonder how did their movies reflect politically? I mean, we just mm. talked about Guillermo del Toro, but I think it would just be interesting to see what artists Romero reached out to and how yeah. their politics aligned either with or against his. Simon Pegg actually like has had, I read a, uh, like a very brief interview with him. I think it was in that New York Times article you maybe have sent me where it mentions how he like really respects Romero and how he really puts like the thought into, you know, these movies, like what's the content in them. Not to say, I feel like Shaun of the Dead, like his kind of parody movie, I feel like it really doesn't exist without this movie. And I think Mm. because they made the movie as part of that group, I think this was their inspiration, 100%. I think he says as much too. I don't think he claims to have done anything new with that movie. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and it, 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 the thing, the biggest shame is that he didn't really make a real living. I mean, he, li- you know, he like lived, but he didn't make money off of this. And I wonder if that like makes him sad or if he's just happy he got to make these movies because they're great. I feel like maybe... Correct me if I'm wrong, but the option could have been there to maybe make some amount of money, not with this specific movie, but later on, again, like maybe reaching out to more Hollywood production-esque companies. Yeah. And... Dawn of the Dead made like 65, 70 million. Gotcha. So I think Why that did one, he, like... Did he make any money off of that? or He must have, because that was actually distributed by like a larger studio. Gotcha. I mean, because you needed a you know distribution. But I don't think it was only a $600,000 budget. If I remember correctly, oh, that's still like really small. Yeah, 1978. Scale. That's maybe like three million today or something. Yeah, so. he made one big budget movie. That Land gotcha. of the Dead is considered his big budget movie. I think it has like Dennis Cooper in it. It has mm-hmm. big names for that moment. I don't. I don't Land know if they're the still dead. recognizable. Yeah. yeah, Dennis Hopper. Was that Dennis thinking? Hopper. That's what I meant. Yeah, that Bowser movie. From they, the Twenty Super million Mario dollar budget made fifty million. So that's that's. You know, so he did okay. Yeah, and then after that movie, he just shunned doing movies like that again. I think his very next dead movie is a shoestring budget again. Mm. I think he even said he specifically sought out local dentists to get money for his next movie. Oh, Christ. Yeah, it seems like maybe, I mean, I can't speak for the man, but the money was not the motivation. Um more so just the again like the adoration for the art itself which i think is like really a rarity like i you know a podcast obviously we're talking about movies from a left perspective is a lot of movies that create art around like leftist concepts are Mm. made on massive budgets for big studios and there's obviously they're selling you this item they're selling you anti-capitalism from this massive yeah. conglomerate corporation. <laughs> and when I think of Romero movies, I think, yeah, he has that one, but 
he didn't want he he only had to release them this way because you have to make a movie somehow. You have to release it. You need to just you need people to see your movie. So yeah, I um I gave him credit for for making making art in this way that he wanted to make. I think we actually talked about that explicitly when we were talking about the movie Grapes of Wrath, that these sort of leftist movies, leftist pieces of art really have to be foundational and groundbreaking in order to get that sort of exception. Like they can't just be a mediocre piece that has a political message. Whereas right wing movies can be made in like a mediocre fashion and have that Mm -hmm. message and get produced because they are not a threat to the culture on any way, shape or form. You know, for every night of the living dead, how many right wing zombie movies can you name? Yeah, I mean, you look at Walking mm-hmm. Dead, it's 15 years, 65 million spinoffs. I mean, that's a very right wing show. You look at what's the oh, one yeah. on uh, HBO, the new one, they had the one season uh, that's based on the video game. The Last of Us. The last, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's got a right wing message. It's based on the Palestinian conflict. So Yeah, when I found that out. I, <laughs> I did I was, not I know that you... until this exact moment. You yeah. see it once you yeah yeah it's wow. pretty rotten that's shocking yeah i'm sorry i also had that's to, okay. I, I also was on a podcast and someone i think i think nick mentioned it who's on uh levi's podcast he's like oh did you know that it was based on I'm like oh <laughs> I'm <not> that. <laughs> that, that, that's you know that that moment but i mean it shouldn't be really that surprising given most movies have yeah liberal to rightish wing take on everything from military to yeah if you have certain weapons in your movie the department of defense is basically just funding the movie at that point so i wonder then does the zombie genre just naturally it's a dod shell so (laughs) right of course so it's just unusual that the first guy that made it just happened to be kind of a lefty yeah yeah that's uh it's like they couldn't hide it being good. People, you know, they like what mm-hmm. they like, and it became extremely popular. It has to be, you know, in most people's top. It's in my top, you know, 10 or 15 horror movies across any genre. It's probably my favorite zombie movie, though. I really like Dawn of the Dead. I think it's a, you know, it's a much different film. But, yeah, anyone out there who hasn't seen this or it's been a while, definitely – Go on YouTube. You can watch it for zero dollars, in color or black and white. Uh, but anyone have any last parting parting thoughts? Um, I just I love I love this movie. Uh, holds up. It's still uh, saying a lot. So, and I think it will continue to for many years to come. Yeah, unfortunately, it is great examples of a, a classic that deserves its standing. Yeah, I, I constantly whenever I didn't today, but on almost every podcast I like introduced the movie I'm like, oh, this classic film. And I just it just kind of like comes out regardless of the movie. And like this one is like it is. Yeah, it's a you know, a, this movie created all so many horror movies and influenced so many horror movies. It's like the, uh, or yeah, I think I said like the origin story. And so. And then what's great about it is the more you learn about it, it's like the more you like it. It's like the opposite of a lot of these movies. Right. We, we didn't learn that there was a Palestinian uh, Israeli <laughs> conflict <laughs> that ruined, ruined this for everyone. We didn't learn that like Ben was horribly treated on set or yeah. something insane that would have been totally reasonable to learn about a movie made in 1967 but i didn't learn anything like that in what i researched no, i read a dozen plus articles and there's never once any no one says anything bad about romero about any of the actors nothing learning Even the that opposite. mr cooper was uh mr sound man or close in that sphere was <laughs> that was insane to me and really cool like i don't know again it just like speaks to like I mean, I don't want to say poverty, but like having very low money and the resourcefulness of having not a lot of money, but having a vision. So I just think that's just really cool. This movie is 
Levi used the word endearing, and I could not agree more. The whole movie, uh, well, I don't, I don't know, but uh, you know, the the sentiment, very endearing. Yeah, what's funny is the guy who wrote I Am Legend apparently didn't really care for the movie at all. And according to the Wikipedia, he called it a cornball movie. But then later said that he that George Romero is a really nice guy, though, and I don't harbor any animosity towards him. <laughs> Just basically saying, like, I don't like this art, but the guy is legitimately a great guy. That's Which awesome. is just like exactly what you want to hear if you're going to criticize something. Is yeah. I don't like the art, but the guy who made it, I got nothing bad to say about that guy. <laughs> No. Yeah, it's usually when the opposite is. Like, it's usually the opposite. Like, oh, right. this movie's awesome, but like Stanley Kubrick is a real asshole. <laughs> yeah, you know, he makes great art, but he's just a piece of shit. Yeah, straight up. <laughs> Which is a hundred percent true. He's that was a terrible, terrible person. But yes, <laughs> yeah, make good music. Make good, make good movies. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I have anything else. Um, but again, we've been talking to uh, Red and Cole and Levi of the Intervention podcast and levi do you want to just tell everyone quickly where they can or what your podcast is about i only refer to it by name yeah so intervention podcast it's sort of a history and politics podcast about the british and american imperialism we're currently running a series on the new deal israel palestine and we're working on one about the ira so look us up i think we're at intervention oh. podcast on instagram and you can reach us at interventionpod at gmail.com if you'd like to reach out. Awesome. Yeah. That Grapes of Wrath. You you should all listen to it, not just because I'm also on it. <laughs> but that's a that's a great movie too that you can also watch for free out there too. So if you want to like I'll talk about another like endearing classic movie that I feel like a lot of people maybe watched in like high school or something, you know, when they read the book. It's a, a good movie and very interesting conversation. But uh yeah, it's been great to have everyone. Thanks for for joining today. Thanks for having us. Adios. Thanks for having us. Yep. Thank you. And uh, you can find uh, Left of the Projector on all the 